from Microbe TV. This is Beyond the Noise, episode number four, recorded on June 8th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Vincent. We, so we only have about a thousand more to go with this to catch up to TWIV. Not so bad, right? We're, we're patient, right? <laughs> <laughs> This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, Cutting to the Chase on Important Health Topics. Today, I'd like to take a closer look at a new life-saving vaccine for older Americans, a piece that Paul wrote on May 16th. So let's start, Paul, with what is RSV and why do we need a vaccine for older people? Right, so RSV stands for respiratory syncytial virus. It's one of the winter respiratory viruses that cause hospitalization and death. And it seems to affect primarily the extremes of age. So if you look, for example, at people over 60, um, there's about 150,000 hospitalizations every year caused by this virus, between 8,000 to 14,000 deaths every year caused by this virus. And then in the very young, meaning children and really in the first few months of life, there's about 80,000 hospitalizations in between 100 to 300 deaths, which is why there's also an interest in a maternal vaccine uh, to try and then passively transfer antibodies through the placenta to the uh, newborn to protect them in those first few months, months of life. But that's not yet a licensed product. But here we have two licensed products now for, uh, for older adults, those over 60. I think most people didn't even know of this virus before that uh, outbreak we had this past winter, right? Right, which is amazing. I mean, I can tell you every year, starting around October and November, our hospital starts to become flooded with this virus. I mean, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, primarily bronchiolitis, but we have a, a lot of children who come into our hospital. It was particularly bad this winter, but it's it's pretty much bad every winter. So what kind of vaccines are these that have uh, just been uh, recommended or approved by the FDA? Right. So, so the way these vaccines are made, and they're identical in that sense, which is that you take the fusion protein, which is the uh, protein that sits on the surface of the virus that is responsible for attaching the virus to cells. You sort of lock it into its pre-fusion state where it's the most immunogenic um, and then give that as essentially as a purified protein. Um, in the case of Pfizer's vaccine, they have 60 micrograms of the pre-fusion protein from subtype A virus and then 50, 60 micrograms of the pre-fusion protein from subtype B virus, unadjuvanted. The GlaxoSmithKline product is 120 micrograms of the pre-fusion protein. So they're both 120 micrograms of the pre-fusion protein. They chose GSK just the uh, only to use the subtype A pre-fusion protein, which makes sense because, frankly, the, the subtype A and subtype B Fusion proteins are essentially identical. So there was really not a reason to have both, but in any case, they both work. The difference with GSK vaccine is that's an adjuvanted product. So it's the, it's the same adjuvant that GSK uses in its Shingrix vaccine, which is a combination of two things. One is something called monophospholipid A, and the other is something called QS21, which uh, is a saponin, a soap, and that adjuvants the vaccine. So this this idea of a pre-fusion state was really made popular with the COVID vaccines, right, Paul? <laughs> right. You know, it's been a long, hard road with RSV vaccines. I mean, here's here's a virus that was identified as a human pathogen in the mid-1950s, around 1956. Mm -hmm. And very soon after that, there was a vaccine that was made by uh, – it wasn't a commercial product. It was an experimental product made by, I think, the Laboratory of Infectious Diseases at NIH. And what they did was sort of following up on what had happened with the influenza vaccine, where Thomas Francis and coworkers had taken influenza, purified it, killed it with formaldehyde. And then with the polio vaccine, where Jonas Salk had taken polio virus, purified it, killed it with formaldehyde. That's what they did. They took RSV, grew it up, purified it, killed it with formaldehyde, a formaldehyde inactivated RSV vaccine that was given experimentally in the early 1960s. And what they found was that of the 31 children who got that vaccine and then were exposed to the virus, 16 were hospitalized and two died. Um, mm -hmm. That set research back about 20 years while people tried to figure out what had gone so horribly wrong with that vaccine. And it's been a long, hard road to get to an RSV vaccine. 
So what uh, were the results uh, of the trials and what did they look for during the trials? Right. So, so um, the, the trial for the Pfizer vaccine was about 34,000 people, a uh, prospective placebo-controlled one-to-one vaccine. The placebo, a GlaxoSmithKline was 25,000 people, again, prospective placebo-controlled one-to-one. And, and they looked for protection against any manner of RSV infection. So it could be just upper respiratory tract symptoms like uh, congestion, run runny nose, cough, uh, low-grade fever, or lower respiratory tract infection, meaning uh, uh, more severe disease like pneumonia requiring oxygenation. And what they found was that the vaccine was was quite effective at preventing severe disease, depending on which product, between 85 to 95 percent effective at preventing severe disease for that first RSV season. So we'll see how that plays out. It'll be interesting because most everyone in this world is exposed to RSV by the time they're three years of age. So you're not going to find someone who's immunologically naive as, as, a, as a, even as a teenager, much less an older adult. But, but if you look at sort of who gets hospitalized, you clearly see the hospitalization rates starting to increase at sort of between 60 and 70 and then 70 to 80 and then 80 and above. Um, and so clearly there's a, a waning of immunity. And so we'll see what happens with this vaccine, which is essentially a single dose booster dose for, for people who are already, immu- are already immune. And, and it'll be curious to see at the two and three year follow ups. And GSK is doing a three year follow up. I think uh, Pfizer, a two year follow up. Does that protection hold up the following year or the year after that? Because if not, then you're talking about something uh, like a yearly vaccine. The, the fact that everyone is infected by the time they're 60 means that uh, something is happening with long term memory, I suppose. Uh, with, with this virus such that people start to get sick when they're infected at that age, as you say. Right. That's what you would have to conclude, because when you're talking about protection against severe disease, really memory cells should be enough because it takes longer yeah. to develop severe disease. So I think you're right. And, and maybe it's just the senescence of, of memory cells. Yeah, well, you know, if the if the natural infection, well, natural infection, it lasts 60 years, that's pretty good. <laughs> so if the vaccine lasted five, 10 years, that would be good as well, right? And I suspect you're probably always getting boosted. I mean, uh, yeah. if, yeah. if uh, constantly being infected, which is what why it was interesting, I think, that this past uh, season, this past winter season, we saw such a flood of RSV. I mean, our, our intensive care unit was really flooded with RS children, severely infected with RSV. Was there sort of an immune deficit by what happened in 2020, where uh, we didn't see any RSV, for that matter, or any flu? Some, some people who have just gotten... Uh, RS disease in this past season, what should they do in terms of getting the vaccine? Should they wait a bit or or what? I think it'll be interesting to see what happens on June 21st when the uh, Advisory Committee for Immunization practices at the CDC reviews data and then votes on this vaccine. Will they make this a routine recommendation for everybody over 60 or targeted to more high-risk groups? Because if you look at who gets hospitalized mm. or who dies from this virus, 95% of, of those people have at least one and often more than one comorbidity, most likely heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, kidney disease, immune deficits. That's who really gets hospitalized. So are you going to make a recommendation for everybody who is over 60 independent of their level of health? I guess we'll see how that plays out. It's interesting. One, as you said, one is adjuvanted and the other is not. And sometimes we think that adjuvants have a role in memory. So it'll be interesting to see if one is more durable than the other, right? Exactly. And it's the same adjuvant as Shingrix, except it's actually yeah. half the dose. Shingrix is sort of 50 micrograms and 50 micrograms of this monophosphorolipid A and, and, and QS21. Here it's 25 and 25. So Shingrix can be a tough vaccine for people who've gotten it. You know, you can get fever, sort of arm swelling. Here with half the dose, the, the side effects are much less. So I think they the GSK learned the lesson from Shingrix at some level. I got both doses last year of Shingrix and I really had no reaction <laughs> at all. <laughs> you did better than my wife. She had a pretty significant reaction to Shingrix. Well, as you know, everybody's different, so right. you can't make conclusions. So what's going to be done uh, to, to look for long-term or longer-term protection? Are the companies going to follow up that initial group of people who are in the trial? That's the plan. Pfizer at least okay. presented to the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee um, what was a two-year study, uh, GSK a three-year study, and that, those are going to be really important data. I mean, does does it hold up? Are you boosting memory to the extent that you then you know have longer-lived protection, or are you just boosting antibodies which are only going to protect you for the season. So you, you, the uh, committee is going to meet, uh, when did you, June 21st, the ACIP, the 
Tell me what ACIP stands for. Sorry, so Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices. So that's uh, they, they're, they're, the way it works is I'm, I'm on the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee. The FDA is, is a regulatory body. They're, they're a body that says, yes, you can distribute that vaccine, but it's really the CDC that's the recommending body that's going to either recommend this, these vaccines or not. And on the FDA panel, you voted in favor of these two vaccines. Is that correct? Yes, we all did. So uh, you would be in favor of of having anyone over sixty get immunized with these uh, one of these RSV vaccines? Is yes, that yes, I, I would. Although I really would be interested in seeing what this two and three year data follow up are, and also yeah. I, I would like to hear that discussion from the ACIP about um, the data that were presented to our committee about who gets hospitalized. Really, it was ninety five percent of people who get hospitalized have one or comorbidity two or, two or more comorbidities. So if a healthy sixty five year old um, would say need um, more than one or two or three doses down the line. Do you really do you want to start now or do you want to wait till they get a little older? I mean, yeah, it really does yeah. dramatically increase when you go from sort of 60 to 70 to 80. You see a dramatic increase, as you would expect, because when you get older, you're more likely to be hospitalized and die anyway. So RSV does not vary like SARS-CoV-2 does, correct? Right. It's it's the, that's right. You don't need to consider any sort of strain variation, although we could make the same argument at some level for SARS-CoV-2 in terms of protection against severe disease. Yeah. But you make a good point. <laughs> so any increase in severe disease that happens as we get further from the vaccine trial for RSV is probably a memory issue and not a strain variation issue. Correct? Uh, I think that's exactly right. Yes. And as you said, uh, there are another set of vaccines uh, being looked at, which would be given to pregnant women to protect their babies, correct? Right. So, so the, the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee met to discuss that on May 18th. Um, both Pfizer and GSK also made these vaccines. And, and essentially, they were the same vaccine, except in the case of GSK, its product it was on adjuvant. But they were supposed to be essentially the same, 120 mm -hmm. micrograms, uh, pre-F protein, um, and uh, unadjuvant had given as a single dose to women uh, who were pregnant between 24 and 36 weeks gestation. GSK eventually um, abandoned their product because they felt that uh, they had a problem with prematurity. And I think um, mm -hmm. there's a biological basis for that. And I think that that needs to be considered should the FDA decide to license the uh, the maternal vaccine of Pfizer, because the, 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 the fusion protein of RSV is a toll-like receptor for agonists. So it's a pro-inflammatory protein, um, whether pre-fusion or not pre-fusion state. And, um, and certainly there are data showing that that stimulation of toll-like receptor 4 can increase the risk of prematurity. In fact, there are some studies looking at toll-like receptor 4 antagonists to sort of help mm. uh, avoid prematurity. So I do think Pfizer should be held to a very high standard in terms of a proof that prematurity is not a problem with this vaccine because the maternal platform, maternal vaccine platform, which includes influenza vaccine, um, the process or whooping cough vaccine, is a fragile platform. I mean, women are nervous about getting a vaccine because they're nervous that they would in any way hurt their unborn child. So I think we need to prove that um, before we, we launch a product like that. That vaccine for pregnant women has already been discussed by the FDA committee or will be? Was discussed on May 18th. And, That's um, right. And there, were, there was a universal support for efficacy, but there were about four people who were concerned enough about safety to vote no. Um, the feeling that we wanted to see more data on that, given that GSK had essentially an identical product, had basically canceled their program. Will that be discussed at the upcoming ACIP as well? No, because it's not. not a licensed product. The ACIP doesn't discuss products uh, in terms of recommendation until they've been licensed. I see. You can find this column at Beyond the Noise on Substack. We'll put a link in the show notes. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent. Hey.